podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Akhtang Millwall. My name is Nick Hart. You're listening to the number one Millwall podcast, etc., etc., etc. Um, listeners, when I do my away days or my, my live footage, I hope you like it, don't always work out the way you think it should. And yesterday I went down to Bristol with my um, my secretive uh, special agent recorder on me and accidentally dropped it in the stadium and deleted half the, the first half coverage. So I'm actually going to take you now to what remains of yesterday's coverage, which will be me describing much more dramatic second half, just to set the scene. We're 2-0 down at half time. And um, the second half proved to be one of the more dramatic events in the, in, in recent middle time. So I'm going to take you now to Ashton Gate, and you'll be joining me uh, both at uh, you know as, as the teams coming out for the second half, and then a post match um, mellow staring at the bottom of my beer glass, waiting for my train to come home in the local weather spoons called the Knights Templar at Pem- Temple Me Stadium. So over to Ashton Gate. Teams are out for the second half, dear listeners. Lions 2 0 down. No substitutions, I believe. Very poor first half. Um, just looking at Simon. Simon Hedgepig saying there was two defensive errors for both goals. I think, I think it might have been Hutchinson at fault for them both. I haven't seen them in real time at all. Uh, Brian, I'll have to see the. Um, Replays back again, but it looks like Hutchinson might have been responsible certainly for the second goal. Uh, first one was a free header, if I remember rightly. So there we are. It's a long way back at the moment in this game, dear listeners. Pushed all the kickers off then. Attacking their home end. Lions will be attacking the away end, but it's, uh, it's a dispirited away end at the moment, dear listeners. Away we go. I think the Bristol keepers had anything to do with the whole game. This is wearing a very um, psychedelic and paisley almost looking shirt. Short sleeve number with gloves. But we've not troubled him, so he's got time to uh, take care of his style. No movement in front of the mill wall, in possession. This will be a ball down the channel. No, it's blocked. It's gone all the way back to Jensen in goal. So he puts it into touch. Poor, 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 poor. Nice little turn there by the 17. He's claiming a handball. I don't think it was because he fired it in. It's uh, Millwall fighting around with it in our own penalty area, though. Lofted clear. Bradshaw trying to do his best to work some uh, possession on a long ball forwards, but he's really up against it. This is Denor. Trying to find what more is muscled off the ball, unfortunately. We've muscled off a couple of times across the middle side this afternoon, listeners. We're just looking a little bit second best physically. 50 minutes. This is Honeyman now coming down the right channel. Inside is Romain Essa. What can he do? Twists and turns. He's in the box. Swings home the final goal. 50 minutes. Twists and turns and puts it away neatly. Almost a repeat of his goal at Pompey on Tuesday night. Nice finish. No more on Essa. Another Millwall. work space inside the box and put it away nicely. 2-1. One of our own, dear listeners. Honeyman 
USA now. The ball forwards, Ronaldo's going to chase it down. He gets there. Has he got anyone to aim at? It's in towards Watmore. Finish, 
Duncan from Watmore. You have seen it on your Sky TV replays. By the time you get to hear this old technology, then fuck me, that was a good goal, didn't it? Ball in from the, uh, it's a long throw, it wound its way across the goal, in the air. Duncan Watmore puts it away on the volley. 3 2. Set at half time in that dressing room, but bloody hell, we should bottle it. Sell it. Too early to be singing that, dear listeners. There's uh, one more coming up right on my market. Good applause, my man, no match so far. And uh, Danny Max coming in. Specifically, the um, 
J.D. Weatherspoon, dear listeners, at Bristol Temple Mead Station, where I'm consoling myself with a couple of pints of what made Milwaukee famous. Um, I th- think it's Milwaukee, otherwise. Anyway, um, I just thought I'd mull over a few points from that very dramatic game earlier on this afternoon. It was quite a hard game to assess. Um, I was walking back from the, the stadium back to the area of the station, main station in town, and um, trying to trying to think, well, what do we make of it? I mean, there was some good, a bit like last week, some good, some poor, some awful, some shambles, some good stuff, um, and some quality. So it's a real mix of, of uh, an assessment. Um, there is clearly, and I'm just looking at some of Neil Harris's comments to Rich Corley, in the aftermath of the game about conceding silly goals um, clearly there are defensive errors and mishaps and issues now I don't think Sean Hutchinson is fully on it I don't think he's fit enough whether he's thinking quick enough he's at the end of his tenure as a, as a mill defender a great servant for the club but um, I do wonder whether he's quite on the you know on the championship level these days he was certainly defensively we were found out in that first half. It was a dire first half. Let's make no bones about it. To be 2 0 down, it could have been three. And um, you know, all I was doing during that first half was waiting for the third goal to to seal the deal and say good you know, goodbye, Bristol, because um, we looked awful, um, especially on the flanks, especially on the, their right flank, our left side. That's Joe Bryan. Um, I think also on reflection, I don't think I really picked this up in real time, Sean Hutchinson um, in the middle. We had a couple of crosses that were you know, running across our six-yard line as though there were no defenders there. I think possibly, I haven't seen any of the second-half goals back, but again, I think that uh, defensive lapses have, have done for us. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that because I think that's pretty self-evident and everyone listening to this show is going to be well aware of the, the failings, because you'll all have seen the YouTube clips by the time this show goes out. Um, but what I do want to dwell on is the good side. There are some quality, you know, Roman Esse is a quality turn on a day of, it was a desert, a, a dearth of uh, ability on the ball. For him to, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that was my pizza, just going back, this is, in case you're interested. Uh, no, that, just to dwell on the pizza for a moment, that wasn't as good as the, pe- the pizza that I had in Venice a few weeks ago. It wasn't bad. I, I'll take my hat off to JD Weatherspoon. I won't have anyone knocking them. Where was I? Yeah, quality. The quality today came from Ramon Essi, who has natural ability and the ability to do the unusual with the ball, which was stood out like an oasis in the desert. And the much more hard-running, based, effort-based approach of Duncan Whatmore. Um, now he's he's clearly sorted himself out physically over the summertime. He looks sharper and quicker. He will never be as inspirational as someone like Romain. Um, he doesn't have the ability, but he does have the hard work, and that's a pretty good substitute. So I really like those two players. Uh, for some reason, when he did come into play late in the, in the day, Ida Moe Marku didn't look on it at all. Um, but having got ourselves three to in front, which I didn't expect, to say the least, um, to relinquish that, thanks possibly to uh, conservative substitutions, taking off our, our attacking threat for defenders, which is uh, what I call Gary Rowett syndrome. And I think maybe Neil Harris has to look at himself. Um, because that's really where the game got away from us. Bristol City, when they attacked, weren't a bad side. This, this be up front, a bit like Watford last week. I thought they um, looked pretty good when they came forwards, but they looked fragile in defence. We should have got at them more than by taking off SA particularly, a player that was um, able to, able to um, excuse me, a player that was able to put the heat on their defence. Um, we removed their main threat, so. Um, unfortunately, 3-2 to 4-3, and that, that was uh, the proverbial long way home. I'm still waiting for my train, which is at 7 o'clock. I've had a bite to eat and a, a couple. All right, I've only had a couple in the weather spoons. A um, big week ahead from the Lions. We, we clearly need to strengthen the side. I don't know what's become of Kevin Nisbet. Who knows what the soap opera is around that particular story. Um, again, by the time this show goes out, you may well be ahead of my 
ability to comment on it. But uh, he wasn't even on the bench today. And we were, bizarrely, he named two goalkeepers. I just wanted to say on that, I don't know what the, the point is. I'm going to presume, like others have said to me online, that it's a message to the board. Coded message, not very coded. Not exactly Enigma code. Um, that we need to strengthen the squad. Yes, of course we do. Um, but two goalkeepers seems a bit pointless. You could have brought one of the kids along, you know, give them, a, give them a, an experience of first-team football. So I don't really get that. I, I don't understand that by Neil Harris. But there we are. Um, football, eh? Um, certainly a dramatic afternoon. It was much more dramatic in the end than I anticipated at half-time when we were lost and lonely, gone. We weren't gone by the end, but we were unlucky to lose it. If only, listeners, there was an unlucky league, we'd be top of it. There we are. From the, uh, what's it called? The Knights Templar Weatherspoon Pub at Bristol Temple Mead Station from me, Nick Hart. Thank you for listening. Um, Arrivederci Millwall. Have a, uh, a sip of Budweiser to all you. Bye-bye. Achtung, Mehlball. Welcome back, dear listeners. Well, that was um, a debacle in the end. 4-3 loss, obviously, for the Lions. Joining me to chew over the card is a new voice to the show. Um, and Jay, I, I, I did a course once um, that said when you write a report or any kind of um, written written production, you should tell the people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then at the end of it, tell them what you just told them. So you're here um, primarily representing your new podcast. Are you doing a fantasy football podcast, I understand? Do you want to tell the listeners um, a little bit about that, mate? Yeah, first of all, look, thanks for having me on, Nick. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and as you said, we um, fantasy football was just started in the EFL for the first time ever. And uh, myself and my co-host, Ben Green, we we cover it with our own podcast. What's the name of the show and where can the listeners find you, Jay? So you can find us on Spotify and on all socials, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube at Fantasy EFL Show. And um, we, we record, pre-records every Thursday. We have guests on from other teams' podcasts to talk about their team, talk about their fantasy season so far. And, yeah, just trying to build a bit of a fantasy EFL following because there isn't anything like it about. So Fabulous. Well, well, well done for that. So I'm going to mention that again midway through our conversation and then we'll finish it with telling the listeners why you're here. We'll finish off with that, uh, that, that plug again, mate. So a big thank you for that to, to Jay you. Thomas. Well, welcome to the show, mate. Um, a much more familiar voice for our listeners now. It's, it's the, the, the king of common sense as he builds himself. It's Mr. History Big Dog, Neil Fissler. How are you doing, Neil? Not too bad, mate. Not too bad. I must admit, you dropping the tape recorder, it's transported us back <laughs> to like a 1970 <laughs> grandstand where you only used to get the yeah, the second half of the <laughs> league or something <laughs> like that. You it? joined the team in progress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was I was I was I sat down this morning a little bit of time this morning I'll edit it listeners and half of it's disappeared so the editing was was quick anyway, I hope you enjoyed that live coverage and then my uh, my my sullen staring at the bottom of the lager glass in in the pub afterwards um gentlemen um it's it's never dull at the time, is it? um <laughs> some remarkable uh, rem- a remarkable post match interview um with with Neil Harris in the in the wake of yesterday's Four uh, three loss at, at at Ashton Gate. I mean, Neil. It, it, I don't know if you listened to it, but it's it's um it's almost like an open power play contest, a, a power struggle between Neil Harris and his uh, his case that the well, not a case, it's the truth that the, the the club are not supplying him with the resources to compete in the championship and and the recruitment team, which is um which is Mr. Gallon, isn't it? Off, off field, it, it's 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 quite remarkable. I don't, I can't remember anything quite like it. I've got to be honest, I've never heard anything like it from a Millwall manager. It was, no. uh, you could openly tell, and I've worked in the media for more years than I care to remember, uh, he cut that short because he was going to say something that I think he was going to regret. <laughs> and yes, he's brutally honest. Yeah, but that said, yeah, we can all have our opinions on Neil Harris. And and whatever else, but he is brutally honest. He will tell you the way it is. And uh, I think he was about to say something, and uh, yeah, regret. Yeah, no, the devil on his shoulder said to him, or the little angel on his shoulder said, "It was the angel <laughs> from this time, mate, because you because you were a 
about to land yourself in it. I think that there is a power struggle at the club between him and Gallon. I think ultimately there'll only be one winner, and that will be Gallon, because he's got the backing of Jimmy Junior. Jimmy Berylson. He's actually, yeah, he's actually Jimmy Berylson's man. But if it comes down to a popularity contest, it's no contest at all, is it? Uh, even yeah, well, even the Berylson family will lose out to Neil Harris. Yeah, we have the reincarnation of Harry Cripps and uh, <laughs> Barry Kitchener, and they would still lose out in the popularity stakes, wouldn't they, to Neil Harris? There's something he shares the frustration, I think, of all of us. Yeah, and that is that our squad last season wasn't strong enough and we've gone backwards. We have literally... I think that's, that's spot on. I think that's spot on, Neil. Um, yeah, we've gone first and backwards and he can see it, we can see it. There's something not quite right. I don't know if if Jimmy Berylson has said you can't spend the money, if Gallon's cautious... Or does Gallon want to force him out to bring his own man in? Does he want... It was suggested somewhere that his big mates were Lee Bowyer, and that would be an even bigger that would be a, than Steve Bloody Lone, be, wouldn't it? That, yeah. would be, that would be a dis- disastrous move. I if, if Jimmy Berylson listens to this show, he may do, I don't know. Don't go to Lee Bowyer. <laughs> Whatever you do. <laughs> um, to do that, yeah? Is he trying to force <laughs> Harris's hand? I don't think Harris will see out his contract here, I'll be honest. I'll be surprised if Harris sees out the week after yesterday's BBC London interview. I think if we don't bring players in this week, you might even see him walk. I don't know how Jay sees it and how you see it, but yeah, I mean Jay. I mean you, you've listened to the to the interview. It's as as Neil and I have said. It's remarkable, um, and I kind of agree with Neil. Um, you can't go round um, saying stuff like that, and something's got to give. Um, it's got to give, give quite quickly. I, I did see. I mean, how much credence I want to give to the Lanarkshire Live, uh, a major news source. Neil, you must have heard of Lanarkshire Live, but they're saying that the Daniel Kelly deal may be brought forward. I, I'm guessing at more money to to seal that deal with the Celtic. Um, but it, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a um, a, a bind, isn't it? In a, in a way, because you know Harris is forcing the hand of the club's management, Jay, and and they're not going to want to be seen to be backing down to him. I, just, I, I don't know where this goes. In all honesty, no, and it is it, it's a problem. It, it's it's a massive problem because Harris ultimately does have the backing of the fans. And I fully agree mm. with with what Neil said. If when Harris speaks, we all listen and we we tend to back Harris. Um, Harris is in a bit of a unique situation himself because he's used to being a manager. And when he was with us before, he was a manager where he had a lot more involvement in transfers, in the in the setup and contract scenarios and things like that. And now he's a head coach, and that job doesn't fall on his shoulders anymore. Um, I do think he's getting frustrated with that. I think that the relationship. It needs to be built. It's got off on the wrong foot, clearly. But you've got to look at the situation around the off-season with the sad passing of Sarkic, which through the transfer plans back a bit, we had to then recruit goalkeeper. Um, Tango, there was issues with with Tanganga's deal that's gone on. Um, So there there is things behind the scenes that have hampered us a little bit. But Neil coming out and giving the interview that he did was was quite damning. quite damning for his relationship with Gallen, da- uh, damning for his relationship with the club, uh, to be quite frank, because as Neil said, it, that sort of interview would either force the ball's hand to either say, yeah. this, this, this doesn't work, this, this isn't going to work, or ultimately will force Harris's hand himself. So this is probably one of the bigger weeks in recent Millwall history that are coming up that, that we've had. I agree with that. I agree with that, Neil. Go on. Yeah, it was almost actually Mourinho esque. It was <laughs> when Mourinho used to say something in a press conference to force somebody's hand. And I quite agree with what you say. Yeah, with everything you say there, Jay. I think it's there's something there's something not right, and I think something 
something definitely has to give this week. Well, you you, you look at the um, interviews that Antonio Conte, for instance, gave in Spurs press conferences. They were yeah, exactly. fiery beyond belief. And and this is borderline of that. You know, it's um, mm. it, Harris is clearly struggling to deal with the fact that he's a head coach now. I know you, we obviously all know that the club want to progress with the youth. We want to develop the youth, get them in. We need to become a self-sufficient football club if we want to progress. And that entails bringing the youth through, getting them game time, selling them on for profit and 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 coming into the modern era of football. Um, it's, it's tough with the players that we've got because if you look at the squad, Harris is absolutely right. Uh, at the moment, we're still four players down from where we ended the season last year. That's even including the signings that we've brought in and without future signings that we're going to bring in hopefully this week. So the squad is stretched thin. I think Harris is making a protest. I thought he made a big protest in the game against Portsmouth, bringing on Hutchinson, bringing on Ryan Leonard, when they should really be sitting at home. Two guys that... Resting, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah agree. resting. Yeah. And, and naming two goalkeepers on the bench for, for, for Bristol City. It's um, it, it's quite... The, he's making a protest at every opportunity you get. You've just signed the, the best striker in EFL and you're giving him seven minutes. It's yeah, that doesn't a make sense. big problem. It's becoming a big problem. We know he likes the old guard, your Bradshaws, your Hutchinsons, them sort of people, but we don't know the, the proper... I'd love to be a fly on the wall because you don't actually know if Harris has been told this is the direction you've got to go, which a head coach normally gets told. This is These are the players we're bringing in. You need to play these players and, and you need to progress, progress us that way. So I think he's, he's struggling to deal with that, but I the way he's going about it, I don't agree, but I also do agree in a sense because he ultimately he's got the fans on the side. And, and as you said, Neil, he's brutally honest. He'll tell you how it is, come rain, sun or snow. And and, and he's been doing that. Neil, I, I get the desire for Neil Harris to, to protest at his situation. He's a head coach, I'm going to guess, is, a, you know, in, in, in regular terms, it's like being an employee. You'll often get situations and budgets that you don't necessarily agree with, but you've got to get on with it. Um, whereas he's used to being um, the traditional view of the manager, where you're controlling many aspects of the club all at once. That doesn't seem to be part of his remit at the moment. But we we don't know we don't know the financial situation of the club. Well, not anyone with any realistic view of me knows we're never going to be rolling in money. And you know, I think Harris mentioned Bristol were able to bring in two or three million pound value players off the bench to win the game yesterday, and it's quite noticeable once they did bring in those players. Um, we made adjustments, but they were able to sweep the ball with some pace and, and attack us in weak areas and, and we've got two goals to win it. Um, but we don't really know what the we don't really know what the direction of the club is. I mean, apart from playing the youth, that's that's one thing we can say. But there's got to be some I don't get any sense that the tactics we're still playing Gary Rowett's football in in the sense of having the one striker, Tom Bradshaw, and then to, to some level uh, Macaulay Langstaff when he comes on, but we, you know we, we're expecting a lot of um, hard yards out of players with no support, and the, the, the tactics don't quite make sense to me. I I get that we're stretched resource wise, but you you think set your set your tactics to 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 at least aim for what we want and fit the the pieces in afterwards. By the, there just seems to be to be a direction this quality at the moment at the den. Yeah, I I actually think that the decision to bring back Hutchinson was a mistake. He wasn't good enough last season and he definitely ain't good enough this season. He got left for dead on that first goal yesterday, didn't he? Mm, yeah, and, yeah, well, yeah. I wasn't even particularly motoring, was he? He just yeah. kind of yeah, he just kind of went in third gear past a guy in fifth gear, didn't he? Yeah. I'd like to see that guy against a decent defence because we didn't have a decent defence yesterday. Yeah. I can't quite assess how good he was because I he made we made him look like um I don't know, Pele or somebody yesterday. He was, he was going past his not nice He was bulk, didn't we? Let's be honest. Well, yeah. well you, you yeah. look at the... Um, sorry, Neil. I was, um, Neil, I was just going to say, but you, Harris can say, you know, oh, they brought on these two players to win the game. But we need to look at ourselves tactically because they're, they're very, very poor goals to give away. The first goal was a real bad mistake from Leonard. The second goal, the guy had five yards between the nearest mere wall player either side of him on, on the penalty spot. The, the the third and the fourth goals, you know, they just it's basic balls into the box that we should be dealing with. So I get Harris can say, you know, they brought on quality players, but from a tactical approach from our point of view, 
it was inept. It was very, very poor. You can't keep rolling the ball out to Jake Cooper and smashing it in the air up to a five foot five Tom Bradshaw. It just does not work. And wow. you can sit wow. there and blame the the recruitment or blame the players that you that you haven't got for why these results are happening. But ultimately, tactically, you, as you said, Nick, tactically, we're not playing to suit the players that we've got. Now, we've got SA playing out wide. We've got Watmore playing out wide. We've got Honeyman in a 10. They're not their natural positions. If you bring in a natural winger, his instinct as a winger is to chalk his boots, hit the byline and put a cross in. We're not playing mm. to the players' strengths. And it's... It's, it's becoming a real hard watch. Like you said, it's gone back, gone backwards, the style of football. We've still got so many players that were here the first time Harris was around. And, and we need drastic changes. We need to get younger. We need to get tactically better. And because, you know, we can't just blame recruitment for everything that's happening. We've conceded five, uh, seven goals in, in hit this season so far in two games, which was our strong point defensively. And our weak point was creating goals, but we seem to be scoring goals. So it's um, it, there's a lot more at play than just recruitment here. And I think a lot of people need to look in the mirror at that before we start gunning for people and taking sides because the fan base is even divided now. There's, you know, it's who's to blame. And that that's causing a problem with his, within itself. Yeah, but I think it's the same old. I think it's the same old, same old Millwall, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, we're too loyal to people that should have gone a long time ago. Hutchinson yeah. should have gone two or three years ago. Would you have given Ryan Leonard another year? Yeah, well, is his body up to it? Is George Savile still up to it? Can he play with Casper Dinor? Things like that. Is Cooper good enough to play in the Championship? Let's be honest. He yeah, but he he he'd been awful, absolutely awful. I do think that that we've actually got Tendanga back next week, haven't we? And that yes. will make a ma- massive, massive. And until Zian comes back, he's and he's been out. I mean, we're missing we're missing the quality um, after the international. He's... They they reckon he might be a stretch for Sheffield Wednesday or Hull, but it's more than likely going to be after the international now. Yeah, but it'll be, be a welcome return, Jay. Yeah, sorry, no, go. Yeah, but to be honest, I don't think you can criticise Honeyman in the last couple of games. I think he's done all Absolutely right. Absolutely not. Well, off and uh, I, yeah, well, I would like to see SA play in that role because, well, let's be honest, those two goals that he scored against Portsmouth in yesterday, yeah, they're FC football type goals. Top, that, top where you're playing on, yeah, yeah, where you're playing on your PlayStation and you're beating people for fun. That but, boy got skills to burn and but you, you look at the two goals there though Neil that, that you rightly say the two goals SA scored look at the position he finds himself in when he picks the ball up he's in the central position he's in yeah. the tent yeah. and, and that's where he's better suited I think Honeyman is a central midfielder I don't think he's a right winger he's wasted I don't think he's a 10 because I don't think he create. he's got the natural instinct to create enough he's a bulldog he will chase down he'll win you the ball back and he can give it to the likes of SA who's got the technical ability to create what he's created in the last few games. I thought he was his best game in a Millwall shirt. That's that second half yesterday, yes, I was quality. I mean defensively, Nick, I mean defensively he was he was brilliant. He's yeah, doing the work. Decide, you know, where we're gonna play Honeyman. I would put SA give yeah, in that ten role. He yeah, but even though I don't fully understand ten roles and and well all this lot like I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Uh, it, but it, it, I think that we're suited for two up front, and uh, that game yesterday, the impression I get is Longstaff is very much a poacher, and the ball was pinging around their six yard box, something chronic in that first half, and I'm almost certain he would have snaffled up at least one of those chances. But well, I mean. You look at the the chances that we had, especially the Leonard chance where it come off the post. Bradshaw's still looking at Leonard as it comes off the post. His his instincts are just, are just not there now. Bradshaw does a good job; he runs around and he presses, but he's not a goal scorer. Bradshaw he averages, I think, five goals a season by the season he had when he scored seventeen goals. And as you rightly said, Langstaff is is a out and out finisher. He's a fox in the yeah. box, and well, that's he's what got to get in the service. In, Jane. But, exactly. But, I mean. You know, he, he is the, he, he, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example in the bank. I mean, Steve Morrison, Lee Gregory, I mean, 
Gregory needed his Steve Morris, and you wouldn't have played Lee Gregory as a, as a sole striker because he's not mm. going to be nearly as effective. Um, I, I think, in fairness to Tom Bradshaw, I, I, I take your point, Jay, about him not being as good a finisher or as, as quick a minded finisher as, say, McCauley Langstaff seems to be. But he's that kind of player, and I think he'll do you a, a good job. But both of them <laughs> need. But they need a target man alongside or, or whatever passes for a target man now. If we don't have a target man, I would have thought, and I'm not a football manager, um, but you'd play two strikers. When we played strikers and got the ball forwards, we looked quite good. I mean, it's one of the positives I wanted to try and stress to listeners from yesterday because it's easy to fall into the, the depressive, oh, we, we conceded four goals and, and, you know, we got beat in the end. But we scored three times. And we hit the post. We've hit the post repeatedly uh, last week. There are some elements of positivity in this. And I'm not saying that just to be um, happy clappy. It's the truth. You know, we, we, we look defensively frail. We're pretty good when we get the ball forwards. You are 100% right. I think one of the positives to come out of yesterday is it's not often that we will score three goals away from home and end up losing. No. Yeah, and no, no. Um, and we are, yeah, we, yeah, I think it was Jay might have said earlier on that we are scoring and we are creating. And if you look back under Rabbit's time, we weren't creating and we weren't scoring very we many. Chances. Here we are, yeah, but it's all doom and gloom, and we've scored, yeah, uh-huh. we've scored what five. Yeah, we score five goals in a week, six goals if you. And we've hit the woodwork, we've hit the woodwork three times in two matches, Neil, as well. Yeah. So you know, it's not like we are not. I th- I think that we need to tighten up. There, yeah, but there are plenty of positives, as you say, Nick, going around at the minute. Essays are positive. The, uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, the way that Honeyman's playing is a positive. The way that Duncan Watmore has suddenly turned into Lionel Messi. Yeah. It's absolutely. I don't know what they've done with what more, Jay. This during the summer zone must have given him some kind of um, elixir of life or something. He's well, turned into boy, a different player. What, he's, he's a very really pale man. Player? He's a, he's a very pale man. I think the sun <laughs> gives him his battery. I think. I think that, that's what it is because uh, he's he's one goal away from equaling his total last season. And and I was yeah. one on on the on the with the pitchforks out saying I didn't want to see what more anymore because he looks like he's blowing after thirty minutes. He. He, he made made the wrong decisions, and but th- this hold my hands up, you know, and I'll eat crow when at the best of times, and he, he's been brilliant. He's been probably our best player this season so far. Yeah. But how many teams have scored five goals and find themselves with no point? <laughs> only Millwall. <laughs> exactly. It would only <laughs> answer, be Millwall. The answer to your question, Jay, is Millwall. <laughs> it would only be very small margins. I think Honeyman missed a couple of chances against Watford, didn't he? That he should have been buried. Yeah, and. Yeah. And if we'd have tightened up yesterday, we could be looking at six points. Well, you, you look at the Watford point. game, Neil. You, you look at Watford. Um, Watford didn't win that game. But let's have it right, because they created very, very little. It was only through very, very poor, in my opinion, goalkeeping and laps in, in, in the defence that, that they won that game, because we did everything to win that game. We hit the post, we hit the bar, scored, got ourselves back in the game. Um, but it's two weeks in a row where we've had to go 2 0 down with very poor performances to then try right. to then come back into the game. And it's it's that that's a problem that 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 needs to be addressed because you've got the likes of Zian Fleming coming back. If Fleming was playing where Honeyman is in the tent, we probably beat Watford because he probably buries one or two of them chances that, that Honeyman had because he's a natural uh, attacking player. Um he probably has more service for Bradshaw at, at Bristol City. So, you, you know, we, there is positives. You've got Tango, Zian coming back. You've got potentially Kelly coming in, who's, by all accounts, a, a, an old-school number eight, who's very much like a young George Saville, who's probably going to push mm. Saville out. You've got to look at the age of the squad. I think we've got one of the oldest squads in the league, average age of about 29, uh, 29 and three months in the in the first two weeks of the season. So it's, it's tiring. The players are getting tired. And Neil Harris' team has to work very hard off the ball. And and we suffer from it. We really do. And it's it's a lot of tactical issues that we need to address as well as going after what the negatives are around the football club. But as you rightly said, the, both of you, that, that there is some great positives there. SA, Imarku can come on and change the game. What more? You know, it's 
it's, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, we all fans. I, I will say that, but it, we react on, on what we have right now. And all we can react on is the fact that we've played two games, we've got no points, and there seems to be a, a fire uh, boiling under Cal- Calmont Road at the moment. Absolutely. Listeners, if you're enjoying uh, hearing Jay Thomas, you can find hear more of him on at the Fantasy EFL Show. That's capitals for the EFL. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at jthomas89. Um, and also he's doing the show with uh, at greeny underscore Ben. So do tune in, have a listen to, to the show. Um, boys, I mean, I, I just wanted to, I can't let the, the game, uh, yesterday's game pass, maybe for you, and uh, Neil, for this one. I cannot think of a situation where we've had two goalkeepers on the bench before. I mean, I know it was a... Norwich um, away last season, apparently. Was it? I, well, all right, well, then there it is. I, I couldn't... You, you've done me there, as ever. Bristler does me, because I couldn't think of a situation where we'd had two goalkeepers. That's the only reason I know, mate. <laughs> you checked it out. Look at that. He, he, he anticipated my move and had the uh, had, had the counter-stroke there. That's that's why. You know, you're right, though. Yeah. No. It was a flound. It was a flound, and it was a bit theatrical. And I, I don't. I just wanted to get both your views on it because I didn't see the point of it. Um, if the point is to send a message to the board, well, playing the likes of uh, the youngsters. I mean, we, we brought uh, Tom Lee in yesterday, which is good to see. I like that. Um, we've played uh, the young kid in, in the week, um, Alfie Massey. Um, you could have taken one of the kids on the bench there. I mean, I, I didn't see really see the point of having two goalkeepers. It seemed a bit. Um, it seemed a bit adolescent to me. Apparently, it might have had something to do with Mr. Nisbet, who might or might yes, not. I'd forgotten that name. I'd forgotten that name. It might actually or not miss the coach down to Bristol City. Right. Yeah. So, but then again, yeah, there's no reason why they couldn't have sent for another youngster and said, get the train down. Get yourself on the train, yeah. Get down there, yeah. Or get your dad to bring you down or your mum or whoever or get somebody to bring you down, even somebody from the club. Lurch could have bloody brought him down or somebody, (laughs) wouldn't they? You know what I mean. They must. Well, he could actually jumped in a car. It might have something to do with Nisbet. I don't want to go into the ins and outs of it because I don't really understand it, but apparently... He might. He wasn't there. Let's, yeah. let's, he wasn't on the bench yesterday. Let's let's leave That's it. Leave it at that. There's all sorts of rumour, speculation out there. Yeah. Speculation. Go and find it yourself, listeners. I mean, I, I, I think Neil's probably um, nailed it there, Jay. But I, I just think, I mean, Conal Truman couldn't have woken up Saturday or whenever the 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 the, 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 the missing Nisbet became a became a thing. Um, right. Someone, someone must have said to Colt. Connell, you know, Connell, get yourself on the on, on the coach. We're going down to to, to uh, Bristol. Yeah, but they'd have taken him anyway, just in case one of the goalkeepers went down. Yeah, but they generally take one or two spare players, yeah. don't they? Yeah, one or two squad players, just in case somebody goes down overnight ill. If we, yeah, but if one of the keepers goes down, then you've got Truman there. But I think he was definitely sending a message. Wasn't he? There was a sub- well, his message <laughs> loud and clear. Um, <laughs> subtle as a Millwall, as a Millwall crowd can be. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a protest, gents. It, it's a protest. We we saw it on Tuesday night at Portsmouth. You had no reason to bring Ryan Leonard on or Sean Hutchinson. It was to say, look, I don't want to play these guys, but you are forcing me to play these guys because of how weak my bench is. He only yeah. named seven subs at the Southampton friendly said that's all he's got. Every, every interview he gives, he sort of, he, he gets hotter. He gets hotter with his words. Mm. And then, and now after yesterday, I think, you know, gloves are off and it's it's going to make for a very interesting week because I, I don't suspect that Gallon would have been very happy. I imagine that yeah. they would have probably had words over previous interviews anyway. And um, yeah. yeah, it's starting to boil over. The two goalkeepers is not unheard of, but, it doesn't. What what one of the kids would have turned it down? It sends a message. Joe. What it actually it's, needs is it actually needs yeah. an experienced media hand in there to actually brief Harris what to say before he goes in. Of course, he could actually, yeah, but he could actually decide to ignore it. Yeah, and probably, yeah, but even we, we've about trying to tell Neil Harris what to say in a press conference. But, but there's also yeah. been 
there's also been very little coming out of the club as well. Like normally yeah, there's, there's a lot of media you. updates, you know, Nick, and it's, it's there's a li little coming out. I think the tension's everywhere. This yeah. is this is one of the thing. Just to close, I wanted I wanted to make that point because um, I'm not here to slag anyone off, and I, I, I don't know. I've met Mark Fairbrother. He seems like a decent bloke, but I don't know him, so I'm not gonna. I'm not here to knock. Him. I don't know Gallon at all, and I've never met uh, Jimmy Berylson. A long while ago, I've met his dad, but I, I um, haven't met any of the Berylsons for a long while. But we have lost whatever you people's views of the likes of Steve Kavanagh and Billy Taylor and Aldo whatever their views of them may or may not be, there was a collective body of experience there. And, and, and Neil, I mean, I, I don't think there's any substitute for experience in the, in the brutal world of football because whatever the rights and wrongs of their various positions might have been, we, we're, we're clearly, we're lacking presence at the moment. I think, um, you know, uh, the, the point you've just made about the, the need for experience in, in, the, in the media and PR side you, when it's not there, it shows big time. And I think that's what we've got at the moment. Is it can be quite damaging quite quickly, can't it? Yeah, I think things leak out slightly, don't they? I think after the after the Kelly signing, uh, or mm. well, after it was announced, it, it comes to light that Aldo had set up, I hate to call it a department, because, because they're probably working in the club shop all week. Or on next day, <laughs> club. <laughs> yeah, but everybody has to multitask at Millwall. Yeah, they all do. It. Throwing it all hands to the to the pumps. Yeah, I agree. but there was actually specifically a couple of guys for recruitment that whose jobs are to identify people like Kelly, people like Mayer, people like a Marco. Yeah. And yeah. we're making so many strides in many respects, but we just can't get our shit together financially, can we? We we're so backward in money making and professionalism in so many aspects of our club. It's absolutely frightening, but something has to give this week. I've said it a couple of times on here. It's a big week. Where will it all finish, dear listeners? We're going to find out over the next seven days. Um, I want to thank Neil Fisler for coming on the show. It's fairly short notice. Dragged him away from YouTube. Big thank you, Neil, for coming on, reviewing yesterday's proceedings at Bristol. No problem. Good to see man. you again. Yeah, I think we're doing a. I think we're going to do a League Cup special, aren't we? This week. We've got we've got a special later on this week. Listen, do do have a listen now. We're going to do uh, the Millwall history in in the the little loved runt of the football world, the uh, the League Cup or EFL Cup, as it, it masquerades as these days. So yeah, we'll be back in the week with Neil and I. I want to say a special welcome to Jay Thomas. You're welcome back anytime you like, Jay. Do 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 keep in touch, mate. It's been good to hear from you. And anyone that has enjoyed Jay's input on this show can hear him some more at Fantasy EFL Show. Um, that's on Twitter, and um, Jay is also on Twitter at jthomas89. Do check it out. Big thank you, Jay, for coming on. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Yeah, enjoyed every minute. Thank you very much for having me on, Nick. I appreciate it. And, and Neil, pleasure to meet yourself as well. Um, yeah, yeah it's, um, I'd, I'd, I wish that we could have uh, something more positive to talk about, gents, but this is this is me all. This is the news right now. But, yeah, no, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I don't know what people would do with happiness and good times. They, they, <laughs> at Millwall, we have to invent strife. There was some folks shouting stuff out yesterday at, at, at Bristol. You look blimey, what would you do without someone to hate each week? <laughs> there we are. Big thank you, gents. Thank you to you two, dear listeners. Uh, we'll be back later on in the week, as Neil said already. So till then, from uh, Jay and from Neil and myself, it's a Riva Dirty Millwall. Bye for now.
podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.